This is Dr. David Pomeroy, your host on ADHD Focus. I wanted to remind you that the show is not intended to be a recommendation for diagnosis or treatment of any condition for any specific person. Please consult your mental health professional or doctor managing your ADHD or mental health issues about any diagnosis or treatment related information that you hear on the show. Refer your ADHD provider to the show if he or she would like more information. Thank you. Today, my guest is Teresa Maitland, who um, I spoke with a few weeks ago, and check out our uh, previous podcast um, for the initial part of our discussion. And today, we're going to be going over briefly summaries of what we talked about last time, as well as some uh, continuation of those subjects. Dr. Maitland has been doing coaching um, for particularly college students, but others also in her 47 years of experience. And she has written two books uh, along with Patricia Quinn, a developmental pediatrician. The first is for parents ready for takeoff, preparing your teen for college, and one for teens on your own college readiness guide for teens with ADHD and learning disorders. She's also written a number of articles in Attitude Magazine. Dr. Maitland, welcome to the program again. Well, welcome. Thanks for inviting me back. So um, in kind of summary from what we um, talked about before, I think the three main points there were to, for the teen, to understand and own your differences. Your brain processes things differently. It's not bad. It's not defective. It's just different from others. And looking to develop the strategies and the skills that work for you with whatever your differences are. Um, another is to choose well uh, in terms of college or if it's a vocational program or starting out a community college and getting some ideas on career direction any of those things make good choices that would support your brain differences. And the third is to advocate for yourself. Uh, colleges offer great support systems to help you, and there's no shame or um, discredit to you to at least talk with the staff before or as soon as you get to college so that you understand what they can offer. Um, Dr. Maitland, are there others that we talked about or any comments about those those three? Uh, those, I think, capture the, the main points of our, our very lively discussion, I think. Um, I, would, I would underscore just number one because I think it's the bottom of the pyramid. Like, if the young person really does understand themselves and their differences, um, it doesn't really even matter how severe their differences are. That's, I guess that was the point I made is mm -hmm. um, it's about severity of differences. I've met people with very severe reading disabilities and ADHD and emotional issues who understood them and accepted them, and they made really wise decisions about their post-secondary experience, and they were very proactive in advocating for themselves. So I would just underscore that it all kind of starts with number one. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, and the, we uh, talked a little bit before recording here about one of, uh, I think, a crucial thing for those with ADHD who are taking medications um, and have done it through high school. For goodness sake, don't stop them for college. Don't think, mm -hmm. okay, I've got to do this part on my own. Medications helped you then. It's a big transition. Don't um, leave that assistance behind. Um, and the other and even more important point, you're going to be now living away from home most of the time. Protect your medications. Don't keep them next to your toothpaste. And you don't need to tell other people you're taking them. There will be pressure from others if they know you're taking them to um, 
let them use some or they'll buy some or they'll decide to uh, take some. If you sell or give them to someone and they get into a problem, you're on the hook and it's a felony to do that. So don't do it. That's a really great point. And I think I mentioned to you that I've just written an article article for Attitude Magazine on this, and it forced me to review the literature. Mm -hmm. um, and the, interest, the reason they wanted me to write a practical article is they uh, either have, by the time this podcast is out, or will soon be running an article about a young college student. He was interviewed by Jeff Copper from uh, ADHD Talk Radio, ADD mm -hmm. Talk Radio. Um, he actually had the worst case um, situation occur for him. The culture on his college campus was real loose about sharing stimulants. At first, he just started selling them to his friends to make some money. Uh, before you know it, he was selling his whole prescription. And mm -hmm. one day, he came back from the dorm, and 14 DEA enforcement agents were in his room, and he actually had, he went to jail. And the interview with him talks about how many students, he's an example, they they don't think it's any big deal. They don't realize right. it's a controlled substance, and it's not like sharing another medicine. It's on the list of Schedule II, right, controlled substance. And, it, and if you're caught selling it, it is a fed, federal crime. So um, they, they asked me to do an article that was more practical. Mm -hmm. So... I think and what you're saying is it's happening in high school, too. I think we have to really, our high, families of high school students and even middle school students, the research I looked at said that um, over 50% of college students said that they had been approached by a friend or a stranger to either give away or sell their medicine. And mm -hmm. then the other statistic that's alarming is 25% of high school and middle school students had been approached. Wow. So we got to start earlier than we think talking mm -hmm. to our on stimulants. Right. And I know right. there have been a, a number of studies on college campuses that, um, and these were from a few years ago, that one third of kids who said they had taken Adderall or whatever stimulant in the previous six months did not have a prescription for it. Um, and it's it been used as a study drug, a party drug, all kinds of things. And this is not uh, a, a minor deal. You don't know if the person who you're giving it to or selling it to has a heart problem. They could have a heart rhythm problem and end up dying. Um, so it's not a uh, it's not a benign kind of thing. Even though for you, it doesn't have particular side effects and it helps. Right, right. That can be the confusing thing. And I think the younger that people like uh, in your role and families really just reinforce to young people that this is critical. It does help you. We don't want to discontinue it in high school. But on the same hand, we have to make sure that you know how to protect it be discreet about it, um, because the other part of the research that was alarming to me is that um, almost two-thirds of the people who, uh, who don't have ADHD on college campuses who are getting the medicine, mm -hmm. they, they, got it, they got it from a person with ADD who has a prescription. So unfortunately, our young people with the prescriptions are the source, and it, it starts with this not understanding the casual, the, that casual feeling like, oh, I, my friend is okay. Well, it's not okay. And like you said, it's yeah. really good for you, but it could be really harmful, not to mention you're the one who could get in big trouble. Mm -hmm. uh, so. well, moving to uh, some of the other things in, in terms of uh, high school and then on into college, vocational school, whatever the next step is, um, I think it's very easy for teachers and parents and sometimes students themselves to focus on grades and use grades as the measure of how well am I doing, um, what's my, that's my success measure. And I think that's uh, selling short other talents that um, the person may have, whether it's playing saxophone or robotics or really good in sports. And those also make a difference 
um, in terms of what colleges look at, but also life enjoyment. High school isn't just about learning history or how to write an essay. Right, right. I think as you're talking, what I'm thinking about is oftentimes we if schools may not understand what's underneath the grade. Like somebody may be getting a really good grade, but it's because mm -hmm. their parents are doing all the structuring and all the time management. Right. Uh, right? Or sometimes we do meet really gifted people with ADHD who can get that A by doing it at midnight. And again, that isn't going to play in college, right? So right. Like probing underneath the grades as well as, as you said, developing other aspects of the person's talents um, and helping them become a whole person who has hobbies and maybe volunteer experiences because really in today's world of applications at college, people are looking for people who are more well-rounded, right, who have done mm -hmm. Yeah, other things. Um, yeah, I've I've seen uh, kids who, yes, they're getting A's and B's, but they're up till one o'clock most nights, finishing the work, doing um, the work, and they're determined to get it done, but they're sacrificing by not getting good sleep. Their mental clarity is not going to be good the next day. And the double whammy is if you're taking medications for ADHD, those are they need to kind of finish their effect at 9 or 10 so you can get to sleep. So if you're trying to do homework at 11, not only do you not have your ADD medicine, so you're not going to be able to focus very well, you're going to be sleepier. And then if you're trying to do the work, you can end up staying later to finish it. So it's a bind to really uh, avoid and use time management skills, and that's one of the more important skills to develop so that you aren't trying to do homework and finish it at 11 and 12 at night. Well, I think what you said is really critical because uh, balance is going to be a key to being able to manage yourself and tuning into your body's needs. Like some of the young people that I worked with in high schools um, actually came to the decision that the A wasn't worth it if they are going to get sick. Um, mm -hmm. And actually, although that may not be what parents or teachers want, in terms of being able to be at, you know, having more points on the scale for taking care of yourself in college, that kind of person is way ahead of the game because they know that they have to protect their brain and their sleep and they have to stop and eat and exercise. So, um, like you said, grades aren't the only indicator. In fact, they could blind us to a person's readiness. Uh, mm -hmm. And the people who these, if they've learned to do that in a really reasoned way with good time management and, and, and they have hobbies and friends and they know how to take care of their body, they may have better potential for success than somebody with all A's whose parents did all the management or they did it all from procrastination. Right, right. And uh, I think the the absolute key thing to protect is the sleep. If you aren't getting at least eight hours of sleep, that's going to impact your health and also just your mental clarity and energy. Um, and I tell uh, my patients who are going off to college, there's always going to be something who wants to somebody who wants to do something at midnight. <laughs> tell them no or close your door and wear the headphones or earplugs and um, eye shades so that you get good sleep um, and let them deal with what's going on with them. Um, mm -hmm. And I think you made a good point in terms of parents and it's it's very easy for parents to fall into the trap really of trying to make sure did you get this assignment, do you remember about this one? and structuring the time, keeping a kind of micro watch on what's going on. Um, and then essentially the parent's a co-student, but then you get to college and you're on your own. Um, mm -hmm. So parents need to take a coach role and not be one of the players. Well, that, that's 
that's a key. I, I think that coach metaphor is excellent because you always think about, like, the sports model of coaching. The coach plays a really critical role um, before the game, right, supervising mm-hmm. the training training, holding people accountable, and then after the game, right, and during the game, they're there, but they never go in the game, <laughs> uh, yeah. right? They, they're on the sidelines, maybe calling out plays or, you know, yelling and, and screaming, but they coach never does play, you know, shoots the basket, and right. I think for a lot of parents of young people with these differences, that line gets blurred because they do have somebody who has trouble falling through and they're afraid to have them fail. So sometimes they shoot the basket for the kids. They write the paper or they um, force the issue. And although that may, again, go back to the grades, that might get somebody the grades, it's dangerous for the future because they're not learning all those important planning skills and uh, time management skills that the parent probably has. Mm-hmm. But it's hard for I, I would I've not been a parent and I've had an opportunity more recently with a, a relative who I'm now taking a, a parenting role with who has a long history of learning and attention problems. And I see how hard it is when you have somebody who really is distractible and they mean well and they're disorganized. It's so easy to do it for them, but it, uh, it's like giving them the fish instead of teaching them the fish. Right. So, um, I think that with the sports analogy and, um, analogy and the coach after the game I think good coaches aren't going to berate everything everybody for what they didn't do but mm-hmm. to support them and say hey you know losing is part of the way things go these are what some things we can maybe improve on but these are the things you did well and we can continue to develop those strengths and um, having parents understand You have to support what went well and give advice, but not um, shaming and blaming in terms of what didn't go well or threatening, gee, if you don't do well, you aren't going to get into a good college because that's Mm -hmm. just going to increase the anxiety for for the team. Well, and let me just say the books that you mentioned, what promoted Dr. Quinn and I, what really motivated us to write, especially the Ready for Takeoff book, is that she – you know, in the role that you have, she's a developmental pediatrician, and she would see parents getting in the game. And as an educator, I would see parents getting in the game. And we wanted to have a way to really help people um, understand. We understand why people get in the game when you have kids with these differences. Sure. And, but we wanted to give people a process where they they could slowly scaffold their young person. Mm-hmm. To take the reins and the reason we named it ready for takeoff we were thinking you know if you look at how pilots get trained uh, they nobody says to them right we're going to just drop you off at the airport and now it's your turn to fly they do hundreds yeah. of hours of co-piloting and and we thought wow we don't do that with our young people when they go to college we're co-piloting co-piloting right we're kind of take we're flying the plane sometimes and then we give it over to them with no middle ground so how do we help parents play that middle ground role because if they let go of control many times kids with these differences don't pick up the slack right right and um, we have the strategy and it it is a skill the parents need to develop and i think that's true throughout adolescence where the task is to gain the skills to become independent. Um, And I think what many parents and people in general lose sight of is you can be caring for someone by helping them become independent, Um, letting them see the consequences of not following through or not completing things, but better to do that at kind of at home and during high school when the consequences aren't as much as gee, you flunked out of college. So caring by letting the team become more independent and learn how to do it, that's uh, the focus rather than, well, I care about you, so I'm going to help you all along the way, which is really enabling the problem. And what we talk about in the book is exactly that, the difference between enabling and empowering. Um, And let me just share, you know, I I interviewed about why I coached, 
probably thousands of students, but I took it in a very deliberate fashion. I interviewed about 100 students to find out what their transition experience was and what they wished hmm. they would have done and what advice they would give. And what motivated me again to, to have this become my career, right, and help parents and young people get ready is to, almost every student said they wished their parents would have let them fail. Um, and that many of them talked about that uh, because of the, maybe they got special help in high school and maybe their parents would call the school and activate their IEP or their 504 plan. And if they were late with a the paper, they would ask, they would say, well, it's in her IEP to have extensions. And what they talked to me about was how sometimes the modifications and accommodations that the schools offer and the way parents fight for them actually can backfire and prevent a person from actually facing the consequence of a bad decision mm -hmm. and, and and learn from it so it you know my my experience is many times parents in high school don't want to let a failure experience happen because they worry their young person won't get into the right college but what they don't understand is if they get into the right college because of all the structures the parents and the teachers are doing we're right. doing them a great service right they aren't going to all of a sudden know how to do it when they get to college even though the support may be, be there at college it's still going to be more hands-off this is what right. you can do but it's up to you to do it um, and one yeah. thing that uh, many people ask and I think a lot of colleges figure oh you have ADD or you have dyslexia so one of the things you need is extra time on tests and that's not again not always an advantage and not sometimes it may give folks with ADHD more of an advantage against those who don't have it um, so I really try to get into detail of uh, are there is it math tests that are problems or reading tests is it where you have to write an essay is it more of a, a, uh, a specific area around organizing your thoughts and writing an essay under kind of time pressure or is it math facts that get in your way of showing that you know how to do calculus so if you need a calculator so you don't get mixed up just on the multiplication part and then you can uh, demonstrate you can understand the calculus part fine have the calculator but you may not need the extra time uh, so really sorting that out is is important I do want to get to go ahead no, no, go. It's good. Um, I wanted to get to, and you touched on the, the student's perspective of um, what helps or what worked against them during high school. How about parents' perspective in terms of how they can approach it uh, in the best way? Well, what's coming to me is an example of, in the interviewing of these students, I met students whose parents actually deliberately started coaching their young person, maybe starting in middle school. Like for example, if we take, um, if we take an example of how can a young person learn what their disability is and learn how to advocate for themselves. Um, I feature a young girl in the book whose mother was a special education teacher and starting in middle school, whenever there was a, an IEP meeting, she she started making her daughter come to those meetings. Um, her do the school actually fought her on that and thought her daughter was too young, but she hmm. wanted her daughter to come at least for a part of the meeting um, and to be able to talk about what's going well and what wasn't. Um, and maybe sometimes she just listened, but she was slowly, slowly preparing her to say, you have a difference. We have these meetings every year and we try to figure out what you need. Um, and the girl was a very shy girl. She hated it. But what she said is then by ninth grade, her mother and she would talk before they went to the meetings and they would decide what role the daughter might play. And mm -hmm. um, the, the mom would coach the daughter to talk about um, why she felt she needed like a computer for essay because the school wasn't giving mm -hmm. her a computer for essay test. So the mom was 
was coaching, just like the sports coach, before the meeting, they would make a list of what accommodations helped you, which ones didn't, what kind of strategy work do you want people to do with you this year, and then the mom would say, which piece do you think you feel comfortable talking about, and what if people say no to you? What might mm-hmm. you say? And, of course, it was so cool because the mom um, was in the background preparing her, but then she was also in the meeting so that if things got a little out of hand, she could intervene and, and take charge for her daughter. By right. Or, yeah, yeah, I think that's an excellent perspective. And I, I guess I had assumed that in uh, 504 meetings and IEP meetings, the student was attending along with parents and teachers and uh, – I can see how that's a very important part um, to have the student there, at least for some of it, to learn how to speak her own um, concerns and ask, what can you do? Or she and mother have talked about it. So to be able to say, I understand that it would be possible for me to have a calculator, um, that it wouldn't be uh, out of line for me to have access to a computer or be able to have someone to take notes for me in class and those kinds of things, which then helps with that self-advocacy. Um, right. That's great. And, and, it, what, and I think to assume that the young person is always at the meeting might not be accurate because even if they're being invited, sometimes they're saying no and then their parents don't make them come, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And the, the research on college transition does say that one uh, the people who have participated actively in their school meetings have a better transition. So, for example, this is a place where this mom, because she was perhaps a special ed teacher, knew this was a great arena to teach a whole bunch of skills. What she did that was so neat is by senior year, she told her daughter, I'm not going with you to any meetings. Now, unless there's an emergency with somebody that you can't handle, my job is going to be to coach you mm-hmm. for every and to help you prepare yourself, even rehearse with you what you might say, and then talk with you afterward. But she actually made a decision that she would not contact the school on the behalf of her daughter at all. So what that meant is that um, if there was a problem with a regular ed teacher, she would coach the girl how to deal with that. Um, And that's where I think, again, for parents, it's sort of like we understand we can't give control that's an example in the school, right? Would it be mm-hmm. helpful for me to give an example with medication management of how parents could coach? Mm-hmm. Well, you share it too, because I'm sure you do this all the time, because I think that's another, there's so many specific skills where we could give an example, like how do you teach somebody to wake themselves up, <laughs> right? Right, so and a- remember your medication in the morning, and um, I think it, there's a wide variety in terms of how teens feel and think about their medication. Oh, it's just for school, or I don't like the way it makes me feel, one thing or another, and that's important for me to address with the teen. Um, But what occurs to me in in terms of talking about how parents can develop the skills to to coach, many of them are... um, kind of used to in grade school and middle school I had to do this and they think of needing to have to do it they may have a lot of anxiety understandable about their child but also a more general anxiety kind of issue so um, Mm -hmm. looking at where do parents get some coaching on how to do it whether it's some counseling to deal with their own emotions or coaching in terms of really the process and, and the steps That's a really great point because I think it's not natural. I mean, let me back up and say some people's personalities naturally predispose them to a coaching approach. And when I say a coaching approach, what I'm I'm meaning is a very collaborative approach that isn't, isn't authoritarian and didactic, like instead of saying take your medicine and you're Mm -hmm. going to take it at talk. It's more forming a partnership with your young person and saying, let's work t- together on you learning how to take your medicine. What do you think would work for you? Um, for that to happen, it has to, the person, the adult would have to understand why it's worth doing 
right? Like you're saying, uh, if they have their own fears about their kids skipping a dose or failing, they're going to have a very hard time collaborating and slowly mm-hmm. letting that skill go. Um, there are there's an excellent uh, parenting program, and right now I'm blocking on the name of it, but I will have to get to you. There's actually um, a certified life coach has developed a parenting program for parents to teach them how to become coaches. It's called Sanity School. And yes. The, name, right? Um, Elaine, El- Elaine, Elaine Klaus, right? Right, Elaine, right. And I did a podcast or a couple of them with her way back right. when I was starting it about two years ago. But, yes, her Impact right. ADHD and Sanity School are excellent uh, parent yeah. coaching um, programs. And sometimes, for example, I I have some I have a parent who heard a webinar that I did for Attitude, and she's asked me to coach her to help her become more of a coach because she's by nature more authoritarian, and she's more controlling, and she's fearful about failure, and it's really hard for her to to back off and be a partner with her son. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So I think I think you're right. Like, what are what are the prerequisites that a parent needs to move into this role? And one of them, one of them is to understand that in that role, you can actually be building the executive functioning skills of your child. That when you're telling them what to do, you're actually being their frontal lobes. When you're right. coaching them by asking them questions and letting them think through solutions, you're actually giving them the chance to mobilize their own problem-solving skills. All of which will be needed in independence in, in college and in life. Right. So and value it. And as uh, usual, we've run out of ta- time and still have other things to <laughs> talk about, so hopefully we can um, have another installment of, of this. Um, to summarize some of the things we talked about today, number one, with medications, if you're going to college and you're taking medications, don't stop them, but also don't sell them or give them, give them away. That's a uh, major potential for disaster. Grades aren't the only indicators of success in high school, and the balance of other activities are important in learning um, for parents to learn the role as coach and really use the sports analogy of the coach doesn't play but can give you advice and pointers beforehand and afterwards. My guest today has been Teresa Maitland, who has done a lot of research into coaching teens and families and has a lot of experience doing it. She's written two books, uh, Ready for Takeoff, which is one for parents, and On Your Own, which is for teens, in terms of getting ready for that transition to college. And Dr. Maitland, thank you again so much for being on the show. Well, thank you, David, and I'm so glad that you exist out there as as someone who's there for all the families in, in the Northwest. Thank and, you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, and thank you, audience, for your listening attention, and I look forward to bringing you more facts and information on our next show.